Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. This is a Currents episode. Currents are shorter and less heavily produced than our full-length episodes and generally focus on a single topic. As always, links to books, articles, and organizations mentioned are available on the episode page at jimrutshow.com. That's jimrutshow.com. Today's guest for this Currents episode is David Fuller, a UK-based journalist and filmmaker and founder of Rebel Wisdom. It's good to be here, Jim. Hey, good to talk to you again, David. Always interesting conversations. Yeah, David's uh, Rebel Wisdom is one of the most interesting and impactful of the new distributed sense-making platforms. It's truly an innovative example of the new journalism. You can find Rebel Wisdom at rebelwisdom.co.uk or search YouTube for Rebel Wisdom. Today, we're going to hear from David about his views and the history and what comes after the intellectual dark web. So, David, let's start. What is the intellectual dark web? Who are they? When did it start? What do they do? Yeah, there's a, there's a fair bit of history that we have to recap, Jim. Let's, let's try and kind of keep it as light as possible. Um, why I think this is a really important topic right now is because the intellectual dark web was a, an attempt to solve the problem of truth and the problem of sense making in the digital age. And I think all of the things that it was responding to uh, when it was kind of constellated, and that was in around 2018, are even more pressing now. And I think, I don't know if you'd agree with me, but this sense of solving the problem of truth and the problem of sense-making in the digital media age seems that it's at the, at the core of solving any of the other kind of really pressing problems. Because if we don't know what's true, we can't really coordinate, we can't react. Yeah, I would certainly agree with you in, you know, in our work in the Game B world, for instance. Uh, I would not say that sense-making is necessarily the hardest of the problems that need to be solved, but it's the first one that needs to be solved. Because without the ability to uh, identify truth and have and have people adhere to it and apply it in a sensible fashion, it's very, very difficult to solve any of the other uh, parts of the so-called meta crisis. So uh, absolutely with you there. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up Game B because um, that's why I think this is a really valuable podcast that you've put together because it's it's listened to by a lot of people who are approaching these questions at a really high level. And so originally... The intellectual dark web was framed as something of a Game B enterprise. And I don't know if you want to recap what that what that might mean, what Game B is at this point before we go any, any further into it. Yeah, to my mind, Game B is the uh, attempt some of us have been working on, including uh, some of the members of the IDW, since 2012 to develop a new social operating system for humanity, uh, which its goal is to avert uh, the failure modes, the self-terminating modes that we what we think of game A is headed on to, whether that's uh, overpopulation, uh, overheating of the planet, running out of natural resources, endogenous failures such as wars or economic collapse, etc., and literally replacing that with a better social operating system uh, that whose hallmarks are self organized organizing, uh, network-centric, decentralized, and metastable. Yeah, and then I guess within the sense-making realm, you're looking at kind of what are the game A self-terminating systems that are destabilizing or, or, or are corrupting the information ecology. And I, I, I look at the intellectual dark web, and particularly Brett Weinstein and Eric Weinstein had a conversation on the Rubin Report so Brett Weinstein, the evolutionary biologist, Eric Weinstein is a mathematician, and they're, there's, they're, they're brothers. It's not a coincidence they have the same, the same surname. But they were on a show called The Rubin Report and talking about how truth-seeking cannot survive an encounter with market forces. And I think, of all things, that sort of summarizes the problem and, and that's a problem that, that then infests academia because you get motivated research. It infests journalism because you get um, financial motives, like truth as, a, as an enterprise. And in a way, you could argue that academia and journalism properly exercised is actually a game B enterprise. If you're making truth the highest value, it's actually a game B enterprise. So you then look at what are the market failures and the, and the failure conditions of that enterprise. 
kind of truth-seeking enterprise. And the intellectual dark web was originally consisted of a group of public intellectuals, a group of podcasters, including people like Sam Harris, Joe Rogan, Jordan Peterson, uh, Brett and Eric, obviously, Heather Hying, Brett's wife, Claire Lehman of Quillette. And Quillette, the magazine, was sort of considered something of a kind of in-house magazine for the intellectual dark web. It was framed as people who tended to reject orthodoxy, who uh, engaged in first principles thinking, didn't go along with the crowd. And it was also, if there was a... uh, if there was a perspective that it was sort of coalesced around, that it was often criticized for, it was that it was um, acting in response to what it saw as the constraining of free debate by the excesses of campus culture, by identity politics, by the sort of the woke left. Um, so it had a political aim, but also I know that it was considered certainly, or especially by Eric and Brett, as only the sort of media side of a much broader conversation that needed to happen in terms of orthodoxies and consensus thinking that have built up within lots of different disciplines. Obviously, Brett would be talking about evolutionary biology. Eric would be talking about physics. And their argument was that so many of these different sort of academic fields had got stuck at the same time. Obviously, that's a huge conversation that we don't want to dig into. But the intellectual dark web was was named in early 2018. And then it was identified in the New York Times by a journalist called Barry Weiss in May 2018. And then it rose to, it, it, it picked up steam. There were loads of Facebook groups. There was, it, it, it really landed as a concept or as a meme. It was very, very strong. And there was a lot of energy around it and a lot of discussions. Was it, what was the intellectual dark web? Was it this group of people? Was it a certain type of interaction? Was it a set of good faith principles? And Eric would say, he, he came up with the term in the first place, he'd say that he deliberately did not define it because he wanted it to be, um, yeah, to have a little bit of mystique and to also that he thought defining it would be a mistake. But it, but it certainly, I interviewed quite a few of the members of it and I think it was Jordan Peterson who said, it, it obviously pointed, he kind of questioned whether it, it really existed, but he said it had to, exist in some sense because the name stuck. And then the fact that the name stuck meant that it was referring to to a real thing. And you can kind of argue what that real thing was, but it was all, for me, it was really the coming to consciousness of an alternative to the mainstream traditional media entity. It was kind of uniting a very disparate group of people, but all of whom had thrived in the digital world, had kind of grown up outside the mainstream bubbles and had a lot of heterodox opinions and a lot of different perspectives that that weren't fully I think the reason that they succeeded is a lot of what they were saying was not fully reflected in the kind of traditional media that's quite a lot of words Jim I don't know if you wanted to to jump in at any point yeah let me uh, jump back on that and again as I uh, I knew uh, Brett uh, and Eric knew Brett quite well and Eric a little bit and had we've had some conversations mostly about science actually so I did uh, watch the rise of the uh, intellectual dark web with some interest and with some sympathy, right? And I do think that there, you know, uh, Jordan Peterson, uh, despite what maybe Jordan Peterson had to say, there was some organizing principles uh, that may not have been uh, entirely obvious uh, to maybe even the people involved, but s- struck me at least as uh, where they were coming from. Uh, and then, uh, then also some motivations, call it basic human motivations, which I'll talk about in a second. First, when I look at the people who are uh, generally thought to be part of the IDW, and of course, one of the things about the IDW is there is no such thing. There is no actual club. There is no actual members. It's just sort of a consensus of who is or isn't an IDWer. And uh, what stands out to, to, for me is that there are people from the left and the right People on probably on the farthest on the right would be Ben Shapiro, uh, farthest on the left, at least of the personalities that I know of. It might be Brett Weinstein, who's actually pretty far left. Uh, but they all fall within the broader domain of classic liberalism. Uh, essentially, the you know the theories that I think we can point to is that were come from the work of John Stuart Mill in the uh, in the nineteenth century, uh, and uh, you know are essentially conf- confirmed in uh, the evolution of that thinking into what we might call a modernist uh, perspective. 
and that what they stand in opposition to is, uh, we call it, we label it woke, but I would suggest that the, the deeper intellectual uh, history trend there and there is postmodernism and critical theory. Uh, and in fact, one of the members of the intellectual dark web, uh, Steven Pinker, has written quite eloquently, and also John uh, Haidt, on you know the dangers of uh, postmodernism and critical theory as uh, as applied in academia. And you know, truthfully, you know, from my perspective, with similar sympathies. Uh, postmodernism and critical theory just sounds like moonshine and nonsense, to tell you the truth. I mean, some of this horse shit we hear about, uh, you know, uh, the, we can't say there's only two sexes. Well, you can say there are only two sexes. And from a certain perspective with a certain lens, looking at, let's say, DNA, and you can say people are either XX or XY. There's a tiny percent of, percentage of people who are XXY, but uh, let's ignore that small amount of people. You can say there are two two sexes, but in certain parts of academia, you're not allowed to say that for reasons of postmodernist bullshit, basically. So that's, to my mind, uh, the real organizing center of of, those, of, of what self-organized, essentially, as the IDW. Mm. And then in terms of human motivation, uh, one of the things that I think stands out is that essentially all these people, at least the ones that I know of, were victims of various attacks by uh, mobs online, principally, though in the case of Brett, actually in person and the famous Battle of Evergreen uh, State University. And it's a natural inclination of the victims of mobs to mob together themselves and produce a gang. Uh, you know, I remember when I was in seventh grade, uh, you know, seventh grader in a fairly rough neighborhood. Uh, and, you know, we were at the mercy of the ninth graders until we formed the Pickpockets Club. Eventually we had about 80 members and even the ninth graders were afraid to fuck with us. Right. And so I think that uh, at the human motivational level, again, perhaps subconsciously, uh, the part of the binding energy of uh, the IDW was that these people had been attacked by various insane mobs and, you know, chose to club together to fight back collectively, uh, or at least to find solace with each other. And, uh, and again, that's one of the things I found is a, a big plus uh, around the IDW. And again, a, a kind of a meta organizing principle is at least to a degree, uh, these were folks uh, who were committed to saying what they thought was true, irrespective of what the mobs thought. And by the way, while, uh, as you pointed out, people tend to think of them as in opposition to the woke postmodernist mob, I would say every one of the ones I know of is also in strong opposition to the willfully ignorant right-wing mobs, right? Uh, these are all people who believe in evolution. Oh, how what a striking idea. I'll bet there's not a one of them that think uh, that the COVID-19 is a, you know, a Chinese hoax, right? These are people grounded in uh, science, in logic, in, uh, in realism. And they're just as uh, opposed, probably actually strong, more strongly opposed to, uh, you know, the willful ignorance that we find on the right. So uh, th th that's my take of uh, mm -hmm. what the binding energy was and, and where they fit uh, in space and in intellectual history. And what do you think about that? I think I'd agree with most of that. There's a few things that you mentioned that um, I'd like to pick up on, but not dive too much into. One of which you mentioned Stephen Pinker. Now, whether Stephen Pinker is in the IDW or not is a very interesting question. And I know that uh, some of the members would think that he probably isn't because he, do and actually that he's kind of, even though he's had his own run-ins with kind of identity politics, he, and, and is very skeptical of of it, he actually... He's got a very sort of Panglossian view on the world, and actually, the sort of the core of the IDW saw it as an existential project to to recover certain values that he that he that he wasn't. So you, you can kind of dive into that, but the question of whether he, as a with with his sort of beliefs, is a part of it or not, is a very interesting question. The other the other point that I wanted to make, which is when you talked about the sort of dividing line. Why that's really relevant right now is that over the last couple of weeks, there's been a series of revolts in American newsrooms. Arguably, you could say that that I'm, I'm putting out a podcast later today, saying asking the question whether whether journalism is dead, because and th there was an interesting that the woman who wrote the original IDW article, Barry Weiss, who's an opinion writer at the New York Times, wrote a series of tweets that. 
went very viral and caused a real reaction where she said that what we're seeing in a lot of newsrooms, most famously at the New York Times, when the opinion editor was forced to resign, uh, maybe about a, a week ago after an editorial by a, a US senator, Tom Cotton, um, and, and then a, a revolt within the newsroom. And she described this split between the new younger generation of woke journalists and then the older generation of liberal journalists who were then, they were realizing that they actually had fundamentally different values. The new set of journalists were much more focused on whether something was causing harm. And a lot of them all tweeted in unison that this op-ed by Tom Cotton was putting their colleagues in danger. And, and the older journalists who believe in more sort of freedom of speech and classical liberal values. And she said that that, that split was playing out throughout companies and news organizations throughout America. And this is the, the astonishing thing is the speed that this has happened. Like this is this has come in in the last two weeks, really. And I think I think most people looking at what's going on now would agree that a lot of what the intellectual dark web was pointing to and warning about has now come true. Very, looking very prescient, I think. I think a lot of people are, are saying. And you look at something like you mentioned Brett Weinstein and Evergreen being the sort of the the most clear example of what happens if you get kind of mob rule in a university campus. And a lot of that seems to be playing out more broadly now in in society and in culture. So I think exploring what the intellectual dark web got right, whether it was a successful prototype of something that we need to recover or whether it failed, I think there are different perspectives that you can take. My My take on it is that it... It succeeded in some ways and failed in others. And I think looking at why it failed is really valuable because it it points to a lot of the failure conditions of sense making. Um, some I could come up, come up with on the top of my head is audience capture. Um, there, there's sort of rewards that you orient towards, not just financial rewards, but rewards in terms of aligned incentive structures. You mentioned this sort of sense of them being um, I think you pointed to the idea that they became a tribe as well. If you define yourself as being anti-tribal, what happens when you become a tribe of anti-tribal thinkers? That in itself starts to create um, issues of, of in-groups and out-groups as well. And then I'm also interested in, of that original constellation of people who were in the intellectual dark web, who is still... I, I like the, the frame that Samo Berger came up with, with when he talked about live players and dead players, who's still a live player and who's, who's a dead player now. And I think, I think some are still alive and some are no longer really generating any novelty or generating any kind of interest. And, and there's all of these different, different issues that I'd be interested to unpack later on in the, in the conversation. Yeah, let me uh, make a couple of reactions, and then uh, and then I'll turn it back over to you to talk about you know where it's where it's been successful, where it's been a failure, where it may have been thought of as a a prototype with uh, some level of success. Uh, you know this. Uh, issue of the last two weeks in the newsroom and more generally in uh, popular culture in the revolts in the streets is, to my mind, highlighting what I talked about previously, that, you know, the correct way to think about uh, IDW's stance or positioning, at least, was in opposition uh, to postmodernism and critical theory. And what essentially you're seeing is uh, people who educated principally at elite universities, and this is an important thing to keep in mind, uh, the postmodernist moonshine is not a general disease, at least not in the United States, but it is uh, a high level of infection amongst people who went to elite universities, particularly those who studied the humanities and, and or the social sciences. And uh, these people have been rising uh, in percentages in elite uh, institutions, uh, what we have called in the game B world, the blue church. Uh, think of it as uh, Yale plus the Episcopal Church plus the New York Times and, uh, and its friends and allies. And uh, this is very similar to the generational uprising in the late 60s, where a, a different group of people actually were successful in many ways in overthrowing uh, the previous status quo uh, in the elite institutions. I mean, the, the changes in elite universities between 1965 and 1971, when I showed up at one, were absolutely immense. And we're probably seeing something like that now, uh, or at least an attempt at it. And I would suggest the IDW is an attempt to uh, oppose that. 
uh, you know, the uh, postmodernist nonsense and moonshine uh, is the opposite of, uh, of sense making uh, science and reason. At least I would I would say so. Uh, as in, with respect to the tribe, hmm, how could anti-tribalists form a tribe? Uh, that was my point is that's human nature uh, and is the natural human reaction to having enemies is that you find your friends. And at a minimum, the old famous uh, Middle Eastern quote, uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And while it may be a little logically uh, contradictory, it's extremely human, which is that's why I, uh, I framed it as such. So those are uh, some of my uh, some of my reactions. Uh, I'd like to turn it back over to you, David, and, and for, get your assessment overall uh, of the intellectual dark web. Uh, to what degree it's been successful and a failure, or some mix of, of two that could be thought of as a prototype. But actually, before we do that, I'm going to uh, reference some data I pulled up this morning. Uh, I did a Google Trends search, which basically looks at the occurrence rate of searches for various terms on IDW, and it peaked very highly in uh, June, July, August, September of 2018, and has been gradually downhill since then with a few ups and downs, but is now down at, uh, you know, maybe uh, a 20th of what it was at its peak. And then just for fun, just now, I compared it with the search term Game B. And interestingly, Game B and Intellectual Dark Web are, not, are now at about the same level of... Uh, of uh, salience on Google Trends, even though Game B was uh, basically very, very little two years ago. So it gives you a sense that at least at the, at the level that's captured by Google Trends, uh, intellectual dark web is, uh, uh, is on a, a downward trend. It hadn't quite happened yet, but it's close. Yeah. I wanted to pick up on just some of your framing before about postmodernism and the, the values of the intellectual dark web, because and I find I, I, I'm I'm pretty sure that you're you're not a, a fan of Ken Wilber. I'm reading him right now. I'm reading a brief history of everything, and I we have a tentative agreement by Ken to be on my podcast. Right, and I am surrounded by inter, integralists in my life, and I didn't know much about it, and I've dug into it. And my quick reaction is. Uh, probably no, to no surprise that part of it I find useful and part of it I find, shall we say, three question marks. The part I found useful so far are the so-called four quadrants. Uh, I actually have started using those when I approach certain classes of problems and found it actually a useful framework. Now, some of the upper levels of his levels I find to be in the category of moonshine and nonsense, but uh, that may just be my Philistine uh, anti-spiritualist self. So, uh, I'm digging into it. I hope to know more. And uh, so far, I find it an impressive body of work. Yeah, I was I was thinking principally, and I would certainly recommend the ebook Trump and a Post Truth World, where he goes through the different. So he uses a system called Spiral Dynamics, which I think originally came from Claire Graves, and it looks at different um, different ways of looking at the world and. The, the principal one is the tension between modernist values and postmodern values. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw out postmodernism completely. I think there are, there are valuable parts within it. But the, and this is where I think this particular frame, the, the Wilbur frame or the spiral dynamics frame, is really, really useful to understand the intellectual dark web. Because the question is whether a realization that the left can go too far and that this, this particular postmodern worldview can become pathological, whether you're moving on to a potential higher synthesis or you're falling down to a simply kind of reacting, a place where you're just reacting against it. And I think some of the people in the intellectual dark web did push on to a sort of higher synthesis and some just kind of retreated to uh, bashing bashing the left, bashing postmodernism. And I'd, I'd, I'd say sort of uh, Jordan Peterson at his best would go to the synthesis and at his worst would kind of go go to a sort of uh, a, a, low, a, a lower kind of, what do you call it, a, a lack of synthesis. It's difficult to talk about without the understanding some, some part of that map. And I would ser- highly encourage people if they haven't familiarized themselves with it to look at the Trump and a post-truth world because it goes through the value systems in a very in a very clever way that that also talks about current events. I always found it quite hard to understand Wilbur when it was just talking more theoretically, but that book really applied it to to the current world 
and some of some people you're probably familiar with, so Jamie Wheel, talk about integral as being a really useful operating system, and that the best thing to do with it is to understand it and then forget it. Because if you if you spend too long within it, you start talking about you start basically just getting lost in the territory. You start talking about these colors and these sort of integralese that mean that you're no longer talking to people outside that world. So it's a hugely useful frame. And I think within Integral, it really shows, are you, are you pushing on to a, to a higher level synthesis that sees the value of some of the, um, some of the challenges that postmodernism plays to the original kind of modernist perspective? And I do think there are more, I mean, you'll, you'll have this conversation, I'm sure, with someone like Hansi Freinacht who will um, challenge, challenge your perspectives on postmodernism. But, but I do think that that way of looking at it, that developmental lens is something I've said quite a few times that the intellectual dark web needed and didn't really have. And I think if it had had that developmental lens, it would have, it would have helped be a little bit more discerning about where the criticism was coming from the critique of postmodernism was coming from a more integrated place or where it was coming from a more disintegrated place. Yeah. And actually I have had two conversations with uh, Hansi Freinach on my podcast and they were very, very interesting. And uh, we did disagree a bit about postmodernism, but I would say uh, surprisingly, I think we were in strong agreement that as actually manifested in the real world right now, postmodernism is much more of a negative than a positive. Uh, though as a set of critiques, it uh, is useful. And in, indeed, that is my uh, top level takeaway that postmodernism as a school of critics is perfectly reasonable. And they have said a lot of important things that need to be said. But when postmodernism tries to become constructive to actually build what comes next, as they're trying to do in these newsrooms that, that you referenced, it's a disaster. It'd be as if you took a academic movie critic and put him in charge of a movie, movie studio, just an, an insane thing to do. And I think the uh, uh, you know, this, uh, these eruptions over the last few weeks is just proof positive that, uh, that you, you turn loose people with that point of view on actual institutions and they're going to do nothing but trash them. But, you know, there are different points of view on that. And so uh, my own uh, hope is that we can find a way to get to a higher level of society, maybe like metamodernism, or at least in the same neighborhood, similar values, which I call alignment beyond agreement, if not the same in all the details, but without having to traverse the swamp of postmodernism. Think of it as a side toolkit, but not as a main road to go through to get to the other side. Yeah, I think I think I definitely agree with that. If, if we're not sort of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And again, think of it as a toolkit on the side. It's perfectly reasonable. Think of it as actually a road we need to go through in terms of our social evolution. I say moonshine and nonsense. Love to get your views now that we've talked a little about the history and a little bit of the positioning in historical space and in uh, philosophical space. Overall, whether you think the uh, intellectual dark web has been a success, a failure, or maybe just a, a interesting prototype. Love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it definitely, I, I did an interview with Brett Weinstein quite recently that I'm putting out probably in the next couple of days where he describes it as a prototype and how it's really important to have a, a good relationship with prototyping. And so I would say, yes, it was, it was certainly successful. Um, there was something about the phenomenon of the intellectual dark web and of Jordan Peterson as well that kind of broke a conversational seal in the culture and things that were that had not been talked about were being talked about in in sort of mainstream circles. I I look at a lot of the the problems or what happened with it. A lot of it centers on in particular Dave Rubin because Dave Rubin was a he's a, a chat show host who very much identified himself with the intellectual dark web early on. He saw a kind of an opportunity. He did a lot of really good work at the beginning of bringing together a lot of the, the people on his show in, in Los Angeles. There were some really exciting conversations, probably in 2018, that seemed to be kind of going into new territory. And I think the really interesting thing for me is this sense of a conversation going into new territory. How do we... 
how how does that happen? And one of the ways that, that that certainly Brett has talked about is that you have to bootstrap a kind of safety, and that's what the intellectual dark web did because they knew each other. There was a familiarity. They all agreed and trusted each other to yeah to to engage in good faith conversations that they were then able to to go into new territory, and the. So you had these conversations between, say, Brett and Eric on the Rubin Report. You had one with Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro that was really fascinating, where they, where they were talking about religious truth. And you got this sense of intellectual exploration. You got this sense of real excitement. And then something happened over the next couple of years, and there's probably various reasons why that sense of novelty sort of seemed to fall away. There was... There were lots of high-profile public events run by a company called Pangburn that then came to an end because Pangburn was incredibly badly run. He lost a lot of money. Um, some of the events were cancelled and, and Pangburn didn't give the money back to the people who booked the tickets. And that failure really affected the kind of inertia and trajectory of the conversation. So there were lots of high-profile conversations and then that stopped. I think Jordan Peterson's illness certainly didn't help. Um, and his, his sort of retiring from public life probably about eight months ago um, really also took a lot of the energy out of the, the, uh, the situation. But why I mentioned Dave Rubin is that he, he was highly identified with the intellectual dark web, but then had a series of encounters that and and he was he was criticized by by quite a lot of people there were some articles in in Quillette i think there was a general sense that he was starting to coalesce around a much less sophisticated perspective that was just anti it was just criticism of the left and nothing else and that he wasn't really open to dialogue and wasn't open to criticism i had a conversation with him i had an interview with him on his on his show where i put some of those criticisms to him and he was very unhappy about that and I think the fact that he was identified so strongly with the intellectual dark web, his own sort of lack of curiosity and lack of interest and lack of one lack of uh, the potential of sort of um, moving his ideas on, really started to to have an impact on the on the wider topic. But then at the same time, you've got so I look at this idea of live players and dead players. I'd say that um, Dave Rubin is a is a dead player. Um, Probably someone like Ben Shapiro is 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 a dead player. I think he's too aligned with certain red meat perspectives that he has to that for conservative listeners that he probably that he probably can't move on some certain topics. But also the the positives are that you have Brett Weinstein has has created his own podcast, the Dark Horse podcast, off the success of the Intellectual Dark Web. Uh, Eric has created his own podcast, The Portal, which is doing really interesting work now as well. But the other failure factor and i know that eric and brett probably wouldn't agree with me on this but i do see a certain grouping around i i don't that there are there are perspectives especially from the left that i don't see being included in some of these conversations and there's sometimes you would argue that some of the people who who you might involve are acting in bad faith and there was a famously, uh, there's a, a guy called Sam Cedar who was challenging Dave Rubin publicly, asking to debate Dave Rubin. And the the argument is that he's acting in bad faith. And whether or not he is, what I've seen happen, especially from the likes of Rubin, but this this accusation of bad faith being levied to keep people out of the conversation. And it's a very interesting question because how do you... Is bad faith not always a subjective judgment? I mean, I think we know, I think, I think we can maybe agree on some general principles, but the way that I often see it being used, it seems to be used as a subjective judgment. Um, and I think, I mean, most of the people who you'd accuse of bad faith would probably deny it intensely that they're actually acting in bad faith. But, but what I saw happen, especially on Twitter, was a certain balkanization around certain perspectives. And... My my good friend Peter Limberg has done some really interesting work in this area about mimetic mediation. Who are the people in different he talks about mimetic tribes, so that there are certain certain tribes group around certain perspectives, what he calls mimetic tribes, mimetic perspectives. 
And how do you then mediate between these different tribes? And he calls that the hard problem of culture war 2.0. I'd really highly direct people towards Peter's work, Peter's essays, and some of the, we've also put a film out with him as well. I think he has grappled really intensely with what does it look like to to mediate in this culture war. And what I saw with the intellectual dark web generally was there, there wasn't enough of that sophisticated understanding of how do you how do you strategically mediate between and, and, and bring more people into the conversation? I think it coalesced around a certain perspective and I don't think it really was a, had the ability to, to mediate and to navigate and to bring in other perspectives. That would be my main, my main sense. And I, this is a felt sense that I got just looking at interactions on Twitter because Twitter is just this, it's a machine for kind of enforcing um, balkanization of certain perspectives. Like it, it, it seems to be a very, very dangerous and malignant actor on, on conversations because tribes are sketched out, tribes are enforced, and these divisions are enforced. And it, it just seems to be happening kind of in real time on Twitter. Indeed, indeed. Um, let me uh, let me react to that a little bit. Uh, thinking back on it now, I think you've you've hit on something, which is that uh, this group of people, for whatever reason, uh, have gone into different modes, right? Some will continue doing what they've always done. You know, Stephen Pinker, whether he's in the group or not. You know, John Height and his Heterodox Academy are doing their thing, and that's and that's kind of interesting. Uh, but what I don't really see, and I think you 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 point this out, is a, a community of thinking that le- that ratchets each other up, and you know, I, in my notes uh, this morning, when I was thinking about this. I th- thought an interesting thing to do would be to compare and contrast uh, the IDW uh, in this, compare them with a couple other earlier intellectual traditions that did ratchet each other up. You know, think of the Bloomsbury intellectuals. Uh, in London in the early part of the 20th century, and when I happened to have just done a deep dive into preparing for a podcast, uh, the German romanticists around Goethe and the University of Jena uh, in the early uh, 19th century, there these people had very intense uh, arguments, disagreements, and agreements within a small intellectually sophisticated community, and that's how they ratchet each other up. Uh, it, it may well be, in fact, I would say it is true that you don't really ratchet yourself up or ratchet other people up by having conversations on Twitter, right? Or frankly, having podcasts uh, other than rarely. I've learned a few things on podcasts, but uh, I would say that they're not crucibles for creation of, uh, of intense new models and perspectives. And it may well be that the tools of the modern world that uh, the IDW was using for coherence just don't provide enough coherence. It's very difficult to think in public as well. Yeah, it is. And, you know, Bloomsbury people, most of that thinking was done over uh, dinners, often which led to lecherous evenings, right? The German romanticists uh, in classrooms and in coffee houses. And uh, those were face-to-face communities. And it, it may be that these uh, virtual tools are just not strong enough uh, to ratchet up intellectual content to a high enough level to be really interesting. Yes. And I think you're pointing to a, to an issue, I think, that exists now in the more in the set, the sort of sense making web that that I'd say that your podcast is part of and Rebel Wisdom is part of and the few other few other places maybe like the Future Thinkers or um, the Emerge Network, I I don't think there's anywhere near enough conversation around um, the different perspectives, either privately or publicly. I think there's an issue with doing that publicly. Um, it's very difficult to have, especially when you are quite high profile. I think one of the big failure conditions for me of the intellectual dark web was, and in some ways it kind of died at the moment that it was named by the inter- by the New York Times, because as soon as it was named, the intellectual dark web, the the obvious and frequently made um, objection to it was, how on earth can you say this is dark? Or that these people are excluded from the conversation. This includes Joe Rogan, arguably the most powerful broadcaster alive. This includes Sam Harris, who's got one of the biggest, most popular podcasts. It includes et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like these are pe- these are not people who are excluded from the conversation. So 
it, it, it immediately provoked an immune reaction from the mainstream traditional media that that I think um, I've heard Eric and Sam Harris talk about before that they that, that it did provoke this immune reaction, which is kind of inevitable because you're you're not an underdog at any point in that you're not going to get positive. That, that's the that's the issue with with the media. And if if you're an underdog, you might get positive media. If you're not an underdog, you're 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 always going to be. People are always going to be looking for okay, what's the angle? What's the criticism? Rather than boosting them in in the way that actually the Barry Weiss article did. But so that's that's one of the issues. I think the the intellectual dark web was a kind of paradox that in the moment of it being outed or shone a light on was kind of it, it was difficult to to sustain the sort of the sense of oh these are these are kind of marginalized truth tellers um which in some ways they are in some ways they aren't they all had those high profile encounters like evergreen uh, being the classic one with, with with brett but the but the 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 other question and the one that i keep coming back to is how do we create conversations that that take us into the place of novelty because this sense that I have and maybe you have as well is that none of the solutions on the table right now, and anyone who thinks they know what's going on or thinks they know what the solution is to the problems that we're encountering now is by is definitely wrong. So we need to have a, a way of having these conversations um, that take us into new places, take us into places of novelty and to find a way of doing that either in public or in private there's also my I mentioned Peter Lindbergh before, but he he's talked about the concept of the dark forest theory of the internet, which I think originally came from Yancey Strickler of Kickstarter, where he said most of the interesting conversations now are happening in sort of back channels. They're happening in the dark forest. They're not happening out in the open because those conversations are easily attacked. Those conversations are easily um, blown up by various accusations that, that 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 are easily made on on social media. So that for me is the is the question that I'd like to kind of put out to people listening to this podcast and and the, and the wider community that we are that that we're part of like how do we have these conversations either publicly or privately that that move our thinking onwards because I don't think enough of them are happening. I don't think we're challenging and stress testing our our ideas enough. And I don't think that the structures and the, um, yeah, the structures and the habits are, are in place in the way that they need to be. Um, that That's my sense, at least. I might be missing out on all the good conversations. So it might just be me. Uh, no, I don't think you are. I mean, I think there are some good f- conversations happening in the dark forest or in the shady forest. You know, we have our Game B group on uh, Facebook, which has some pretty good conversations. But to your point, we have to relentlessly police that thing because uh, there are attacks, organized attacks, amazingly, uh, from both uh, what you what could be thought of as the far right and the far left. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, we had to bounce six neo-fascist infiltrators, and at about the same time, Buddha a dozen kind of uh, proto antifa types simultaneously and uh, you know suddenly the conversation went back to normal but it's extraordinarily difficult uh, to do these things on public forums and in, you know in our case we do have a membrane we have membership and we can kick people out uh, but we'll let pretty much anybody who's not obviously insane in after answering a few questions so I don't think these are near the platforms we have today are not nearly enough. Uh, and, you know, part of the answer may be pointing to the back, back to the past. You know, again, as I mentioned, Bloomsbury and, uh, you know, that uh, that crucible of German romanticism at Jena University in the in the duchy of, of, of Weimar in the early 19th century or even the early days of Game B, where we basically crucible that idea uh, in five day and a half long uh, face to face meetings where more interesting intellectual work got done in I guess, was less than 10 days than any 10 day period I can uh, point to in my whole life. Uh, so I do think it's time uh, to drop our over fascination with these online platforms as they're going to be very important for disseminating what is created. But I've now come to the view that they're only part of the job of creation, that we have to find higher coherence, 
higher binding energy, more real work has to be done than, than can be done today on, on these big platforms. Yeah. And is your sense that that has to be done in uh, face-to-face? Well, I think face-to-face is best. However, uh, you know, everything in life is trade-offs uh, in time and in space and in money. Uh, I, I have found here during the zombie apocalypse that Zoom culture works quite well for some things. Uh, it's not as good as face-to-face, but it's a shitload better than text on Facebook or on Twitter, I'll tell you that. Uh, so I think we uh, can be more intelligent, uh, like I have a project going on right now, all based in Zoom, uh, which may actually create some interesting things. Uh, but I think face-to-face also needs to be part of it. Uh, you know, if there was going to be a game B meeting in Austin, Texas in May, but that, you know, the COVID-19 thing uh, destroyed that. Uh, I think that having a traditional in one place community meetup event for any of these new intellectual trends would be very helpful. And as we all know, uh, the formal sessions are only about 25% of the value. The real value is the uh, conversations in the lobby and the hall room around the coffee table and at dinner and drinks afterwards. So I think we need to be stop being so hypnotized by social media platforms uh, as a place to form the intellectual ideas. Unfortunately, I think we're stuck with them for a while for propagation, but I'm not convinced yet that they are uh, going to take us uh, real far in the creating uh, the next generation of good ideas. Yes, and I think there's something about steering into the critique as well, or steering into um, self-reflection and criticism that that needs to to happen as well. And I don't know whether that's something that it seems very very difficult to do that in public, and yep. it may be much easier to do it in 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 sort of private conversations. Yeah, I'm actually having a conversation with uh, one of the well-known opponents of Game B uh, about potentially doing a convergence process in private to find out what it is that we agree about and why the hell are we so uh, fixated on what we disagree about. Uh, And I I do think that techniques like that are going to be important as well. And we have to stress test our ideas, right? Uh, You know, uh, you didn't really go into it in great detail, but this problem of audience capture is a real one, right? Uh, you know, you, you you get a platform that has a specific point of view and you capture a bunch of listeners. And uh, unfortunately, you're kind of uh, caught in the bind of giving your audience what they want, right? And uh, that's not how you really stress test your ideas. You have to and perhaps do those offline uh, using different techniques. Yes. And there's audience capture that's So there's, yeah, it's an interesting question because there's different facets of that in the digital world. There's audience capture in terms of giving the audience what what they want. And anyone who's got, I I know as we run a YouTube channel, there's a comments thread. I'm very aware of that. And it's it's certainly acts as a gravitational force. It's one that I think I have struggled to resist. Like I I could have certainly put out way more... um, popular films but i think it would have been a, a shortcut and i don't think the i don't think the community that that rebel wisdom has built up and the um yeah the the reputation that we built up would have survived if i'd taken those shortcuts but it's very easy to to feel that as a gravitational force but there's also in the world of sort of the big tech platforms there's another form of audience capture which is algorithmic capture that i know is something that i've, I've seen brett and Heather talk about the beginning of their podcast, that they're aware that their podcast is being grouped together with um, effectively sort of generally right-wing content. And I wouldn't, obviously they wouldn't describe themselves as right-wing, but somehow because of the nature of what happened to them and because they they were appearing on certain podcasts at the beginning, that the algorithms are now pushing them towards. So you can be you can be balkanized in many different ways and not and not always because of actions that you yourself are taking. There are also the big tech companies have got their, their finger on the scales in various ways as well. So there's there's lots of different levels to audience capture, and some of it is is not even to do with what you're personally doing. That's a very good point and a very interesting point. And you know, actually, I think I might well use this as an opportunity to announce something. Why not? I decided. I don't know, six weeks ago to take a six month break from the large social media platform starting July 1. 
And part of it is this exact thing, the sense that, yes, interesting work is happening here, but it's influenced by audience capture. It's, in, uh, it's influenced by the paucity of the affordances provided by the platforms. Uh, it's uh, influenced in a negative way uh, by the algorithmics, especially in the public parts of these platforms. So I'm going to take an in, uh, intentional six-month break from them. And I've turned over the management of uh, the platforms that I, uh, I lead on uh, those platforms to other people. They're already trained, prepped, and ready to go. And I'm going to go do something else for a while. And I'm going to see what I find out there. Good for you. Let, let us know what it's like out in the wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> you know, interestingly, I've done this every year on, for Facebook uh, for the last four years. But I am much more in the middle of things than I was previously. And I'm going to also inc- add Twitter to that ban. So, yeah, it'll be interesting. I'll give you a report back from the real world. And I'm sure we'll have some conversations uh, in between. Yeah. So I think with that, it's time to wrap up. Can I say one thing, Jim, before we wrap up? Sure. Just to to say, so Rebel Wisdom's in the process of doing a big series about sense making, not only about the intellectual dark web. We've we've got put out a couple of pieces about that, but also looking at information warfare, talking to Tristan Harris about the influence of the big tech platforms, all of these different issues. And I'd love to hear from from listeners. I'd love them to check out the series and then to hear any solutions, like practical solutions to these problems is what we all need to be working on right now. So I'd love to hear any thoughts and suggestions that people have. Yeah, and I would second that. I uh, listened to the first one of that series, and it certainly motivated me to uh, listen to some more. And uh, David and people listening to the podcast know I hate listening to videos, goddammit. So that's pretty high testimony. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for the invitation and um, keep doing what you're doing. All right, appreciate it. Production services and audio editing by Jared Janes Consulting. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.